The views and opinions expressed on any programme are those of the producers and or the persons appearing on the programme and do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of FRC Media, Bristol Community College or the City of Fall River. This week on FRC Media News, Mayor Paul Coogan presents the state of business in Fall River to members of the One South Coast Chamber. We get you prepared for Monday's solar eclipse and a youth hockey team rallies around a local girl battling epilepsy. All this and more coming up. It's Thursday, April 4th, 2024. This is FRC Media News. I'm Keith Tebow. Fall River Mayor Paul Coogan addressed the membership of the One South Coast Chamber of Commerce this week to provide an update on the state of local business across Fall River. The mayor said there's new buzz surrounding the city as it's been able to put more money into its reserve fund and has also seen a rise in revenue from new construction. He spotlighted the upcoming relaunch of South Coast Rail this summer and the prospects of development along the waterfront. The Fall River Redevelopment Authority received a planning grant from the state to help support the development of a master plan for the 19 acres of waterfront created by the removal of Route 79. The master plan will include proposals for housing, commercial, retail development and of course parking. And we are already witnessing growth along the waterfront. We've just added a new restaurant on Water Street and there's a few more in the pipeline. We are also taking steps to improve the availability of transportation on the waterfront. This year we'll add a trolley service and a water taxi. This will allow visitors to travel the waterfront with ease while connecting the waterfront with downtown. The mayor used most of his speech to highlight the growth within the commercial sector, primarily in the industrial park. One of our strongest employers, Gold Medal Baker Bakery, recently purchased property at 231 Commercial Drive. It was formerly owned by the Atlantic Lighting Company. Gold Medal plans to make a substantial investment in developing this facility to create new production capabilities and jobs. Gold Medal also plans to purchase a, continuous, a contiguous parcel that the Fall River Redevelopment Authority owns. Invigen Pharmaceuticals, I'm very excited about this company, in addition to investing $5.7 million into their existing facility, recently made plans to expand to a second location on Airport Road, and that project is, is expected to cost over $20 million and create 50 more additional high-paying jobs over the next eight years. Nantucket Sound Seafood opened its doors in the fall of 23. They currently employ between 45 and 55 people at their processing plant on Airport Road. And Ice Cube currently occupies an 80,000 square foot facility on Current Road. They recently purchased 24 acres of land to construct a new 200,000 square foot building. This will reflect another $20 million investment in our community and 35 more additional jobs. Precise Packaging, which is part of the PLZ billion dollar corporate conglomerate and is the North American leader in specialty aerosol product manufacturing, is in the development, manufacturing, packaging, distribution of a comprehensive line of contract fill, branded, and private label products, has announced plans to open a second 15,000 square foot building less than a mile from the company's headquarters on Riggenback Road. The mayor said small businesses continue to sprout up across the city and his administration is focusing on economic efforts downtown and in the Flint. The Redevelopment Authority is also working on plans for the expansion of our downtown historic district to include all of South Main Street. A draft urban renewal plan and roadmap for neighborhood revitalization has been in the works for the Flint since 2022 and it will be submitted to the city council and state agencies for approval. Recommendations will be made for addressing vacant properties, improving the streets, sidewalks, stores, restaurants, and improving housing opportunities all along Pleasant Street. The Flint just received federal funding from Congressman Jake Oshenkloss on a streetscapes project that will see road, sidewalk, and infrastructure improvements in the area. 
The city of Fall River is asking the community how it should spend approximately $8 million over the next 15 years to ease the impact the opioid epidemic has had on city residents. The Commonwealth of Massachusetts has received nearly a billion dollars as part of a nationwide settlement with drug makers and pharmacies who were sued for their role in perpetrating the addiction of millions of Americans. Fall River Director of Health and Human Services Tess Curran says the city has already received $1.8 million in funds and is developing a plan to distribute the money to focus on drug prevention, harm reduction, treatment and recovery. She says the city has begun the process of determining the current landscape of the opioid epidemic in Fall River. We want this whole process to be community driven, data driven. Part of that was to have the voice of those who work within the industry um, share their perspective on the greatest needs of the community. So we did that through a strategic plan that was completed in June of 2023. Um, that plan found through the voices of members of the community um, who work in the field that housing is a, one of the greatest needs, uh, transportation uh, is a great need, um, inpatient you know, treatment and detox, um, as well as a prevention arm in terms of getting um, into education into the schools at an earlier age. Residents in Fall River can lend their input through a community survey. It's available in English, uh, Portuguese, and, and Spanish. Um, and we're using that as an opportunity for people of all ages, of all demographics, to put their uh, two cents in, in terms of where we should allocate these funds. It's also helpful for us in terms of data collection, where we can really evaluate that and manipulate that data versus something like a public meeting, where we have a concrete um, you know, survey and we're able to modify and tweak that to make sure we're hearing from certain communities that we want to hear from, such as individuals with lived or living experience, individuals with unstable housing, and, you know, mental health issues. We want to make sure we're hearing from those, those folks, um, you know, who've maybe been hit hardest with this um, crisis, and we can make sure that we understand really the direction that they hope that we take with the funds. Ms. Curran says the city will implement a multi-year grant cycle to allocate the funds to worthy projects. We want people um, to come to the table with um, innovative ideas. We do have requirements outlined by the state in terms of what types of projects are funded. They need to be new, um, new initiatives or expanding upon existing initiatives. We aren't able to supplant um, you know, something that's already um, in effect. We have a set of seven deliverables um, that everything has to fit within the state's framework, our framework, and the, again, the community's perspective as well. Um, we're trying to merge all of that information so that we can make sure we're following state guidelines, but also targeting the, the voices that have been identified through these um, strategic plan and the online survey. The mayor will carry out the allocation of the settlement funds with approval from the city council. Before that takes place, a panel of residents will screen all applications. We have created a 10-person advisory committee uh, made up of various members of the community, um, folks with lived experience, people who have family members who have been impacted, um, faith-based individuals um, and the like. Um, those individuals have been um, asked to join uh, this advisory committee and our plan right now is to do an RFP process um, where organizations, city departments will apply uh, through uh, a RFP that we are working on right now. Um, that committee will then evaluate those RFPs and make recommendations to the mayor and to council as to where they feel based on the strategic plan and based on the community survey, uh, those dollars are, would be best spent. Ms. Curran says overcoming the opioid epidemic will take time and the level of success may vary during the course of the 15-year settlement campaign. She remains hopeful the city will see positive results from the project. We want the money to get out into the community. We know that um, a lot of folks are interested um, in um, 
applying for this opportunity. Um, there is certainly a need to get um, more funds out into the community to address um, substance use. Um, so we, we're, we're working hard to do that. We just are trying to, to make sure that it's data driven, um, that we have a, a solid RFP in place, that we have a solid rubric to evaluate those in place um, so that we can be confident in the decisions um, and the recommendations that the advisory committee makes and that ultimately the mayor and council make. The deadline to participate in the community survey is May 3rd. The city will also hold a public meeting on how to spend the opioid settlement funds on May 1st. April is Child Abuse Prevention and Sexual Assault Awareness Month. Mayor Paul Coogan recognized the efforts of organizations such as the Children's Advocacy Center and the Women's Center and their role on focusing on prevention. Lara Stone is the co-executive director at the Children's Advocacy Center. She says her organization receives between 600 and 800 referrals a year of child abuse. She says her team works with schools, pediatricians, and local law enforcement to educate them on recognizing the early warning signs of abuse. We have to hope that children are more protected and they know earlier uh, about what they'll allow and what their bodies, you know, how, how they can take care of their own bodies. But it's our job as adults to protect them. So we, you know, we, we just try and look at that three-pronged approach. We, we're not taking our prevention efforts out of the formula because we hope that we're making an impact and we for sure know that we've seen an impact with children who are learning more about how to be more responsible about their cell phone use and what um, safe practices are and what online responsibility looks like. Women's Center Executive Director Kristen Batstone says her prevention efforts often start at a young age. We know in gateway cities all across the Commonwealth that the numbers are off the charts in many metrics and especially around sexual assault and there's theories about why that is so there's an importance in especially the gateway cities Fall River in New Bedford in this area to bring increased attention and education even starting as young as the fourth grade so we have programs with fourth graders teaching empathy and as the years go on through school more sophisticated prevention efforts healthy dating safe relationships but really the work can start as early as fourth grade people will be looking to the skies this Monday as we experience a solar eclipse a solar eclipse is when the moon blocks the light from the sun and blocks out most parts of the sun except the outer edge of the sun called the corona. On Earth, uh, they happen about every 18 months. Uh, what is unusual about this one, it is passing through North America. And that does not happen very often the last one was 2017, and the next one will not be until 2045. So not for another 20 years. So that's partly why this is a big deal for us here in North America. It is predicted to begin at 2.17 p.m. Monday, April 8th, and will continue for a couple of hours as the, sun, as the moon gradually moves across the sun and will end at around 4.30 or so. Seven years ago, people in Fall River were able to see only a minor eclipse. There's likely to be more of a show this year. The path of the full eclipse is called the region of totality. Inside, it's about a hundred mile width, uh, where within that hundred miles, you will see a complete blockout of the sun by the moon the region of totality. That will pass through Maine, upstate New York. We're maybe not that far away from the region of totality here, uh, maybe a few tens of miles, 50, 60 miles from it. Um, and here uh, we will see about 90% of totality. So we will s see the moon covering up most of the sun and the sun will appear to us as a crescent shaped glowing object. Dr. Amiel says regardless of whether there's an eclipse or not,
People should use caution when looking directly into the sun. Solar radiation is very intense and you should never stare directly into the sun. It can cause damage to the retina and you can go blind. So we never look directly at the sun and so the precautions you need to take, the basic one, is to use special eclipse glasses. Not regular sunglasses. Regular sunglasses might blot out anywhere from 60 to 90 percent of the sunlight. That is not good enough. You need 99, 100 percent of the sunlight to be blocked. And that is why you need the special eclipse glasses. Looking ahead, the weather calls for sunny, clear skies on Monday. Perfect conditions to view the eclipse. So where should you do so safely? Right here on FRC Media. We'll provide a continuous live stream, no glasses required, beginning at 2 p.m. on Channel 95 and on our Facebook and YouTube pages. Be sure to check it out. We'll have more FRC Media news right after this. Here are some job descriptions on the latest hot jobs list from the Mass Hire Fall River Career Center. Infant Toddler Teacher, Little Hands College, located at 332 Brownell Street, is looking for a part-time infant toddler teacher responsible for providing a safe and nurturing environment for infants and toddlers in a daycare or preschool setting. Job number 206-36269. Parts Counterperson and Delivery Driver, Empire Hyundai, located at 428 Pleasant Street, seeks a full-time parts counterperson and delivery driver, responsible for taking auto parts to commercial clients with limited inventory. Job number 206-35809. Relationship Banker, Bank of America, located at 87 Mariano Bishop Boulevard, is seeking a full-time relationship banker, responsible for engaging clients in the lobby to educate and assist with conducting transactions through self-service resources. Job number 206-36267. Quality Assurance Analyst, CIPLA, located at 927 Current Road, is looking for a full-time Quality Assurance Analyst. For more information, call 508-324-1481. Crystal Springs, located at 256 Albany Street, has an immediate need for the following full and part-time positions. Day Program Caregiver, job number 206-34868. On-call day habilitation aid, job number 206-35695. For more information about these or other positions, visit Mass Hire Job Quest at jobquest.dcs.ol.mass.gov or call the Mass Hire Fall River Career Center at 508-730-5000. My name is David Perry. I'm the president of the Greater Fall River Food Pantry. And what we do here is we provide food to clients that are in need. We're always trying to get more people involved in, in what we're doing. And we're trying to concentrate on youth. You know, and it's, it's all about helping people. And that's what we should all be doing is helping someone. Um, so it's a great opportunity for them to you know, come down here and give us, give us a couple of hours a week. It's not long. It's two hours a day. And once they start volunteering, it's, it's like a family. It really is. Um, so getting these younger people involved you know, it, it's, it's just great. It's great to see. It's great to have younger generations seeing what's going on in the real world, as they call it, and uh, helping out. I've gotten a new outlook on the community. I've been able to see all sides, help me learn just a lot about Fall River as a whole. We like to get uh, students in from 14 years of age and, and older. It's not about the greater Fall River Community Food Pantry. It's about what the greater Fall River Community Food Pantry does as an outreach. We want to reach out to the community. Most schools require that the students put in a volunteer hours. We're a perfect example of receiving those students and that way they get their hours accredited and, uh, and it, it gives them a good learning experience. Volunteering here uh, made you feel good, you know, felt like you were helping out the community and uh, also 
It uh, really helped me out with uh, making my uh, application stand out with having volunteer hours, like on the, like when I'm applying for jobs. I've been on the hunt right now, and I've gotten a lot more interviews since I did charity work here. It makes you really stand out, and also just feels good helping out the community. I love hearing other people's lives, other pe how other people live, other people's families. It's interesting, and I really like to do this work. Come down and see what it's like. Come down and take an opportunity to help someone else. You know, come and see what's really happening in the world out there. Welcome back. And finally this week, we have the story of an eight-year-old Bridgewater girl and the local Forever Youth hockey team that adopted her to bring awareness to her battle with two rare forms of epilepsy. At the age of one, Maggie Mendonca was stricken with multiple seizures and a stroke, resulting in her being diagnosed with two forms of epilepsy that affect only one one hundredth of a percent of the population. She has right side paralysis on her right side, so she cannot use her right side. She does have mobility of her right leg and some mobility of her right hand, but it's not to a full function. She can speak some words, but she, the most she can probably speak is three to four words at a time, but it's never, what you, if you ask her a question, sometimes she'll give you yes or no, or she'll stay with the last thing you said to her, because that's the only thing she can register. But most of the time, it's not, you can't have, she won't have a conversation with you. Maggie attends school and enjoys sharing time with her dad, mom Ashley, and older sister Leona. Paul works third shift at a regional warehouse, while Ashley is a local school teacher. Their split shifts make it easier for them to care for Maggie. As time passes, the Mendonkas have seen the need to make improvements to their home to better accommodate Maggie's needs. The family has set up a GoFundMe page seeking donations for repairs that will total well over $100,000. With her Maggie, she has drop seizures, so we're trying to make an addition safer for Maggie to have like um, bigger doorways for her, uh, a special bathroom just for her so she can not, we don't have to worry about her possibly falling in the shower, having a seizure, um, and also just pat, we got a special padding in the, in the, throughout the house, that way if she does have a drop seizure, it's not really affecting her because it's very hard. And we're also going to have a, a chair lift that goes up and down the stairs for her because some days it's easier for her to go upstairs, some days we have to try to carry her upstairs. Along with the GoFundMe page, Paul started a Facebook group documenting Maggie's progress and created hats, t-shirts, and other apparel with the message, Maggie Strong and Team Maggie, with a focus on her favorite zoo animal. Maggie loves pandas. Ever since she was a baby, pandas were her thing. So we kind of stuck with pandas, and then when the whole, everything happened with her epilepsy and stuff, we made um, everything with the pandas do the logo, and we had, and then, we kind of made it angry because Maggie is a little angry. So we call her a little, our little angry panda, so. Maggie also enjoys sports, especially hockey. She loves watching the Bruins and rooting for her favorite player, center Charlie Coyle. Paul is friends with fathers of players on the under-14 team of the Somerset Watapa Swansea Chiefs Youth Hockey League at Driscoll Arena in Fall River. Paul had the idea to create a Maggie Strong hockey jersey in the angry panda motif. Word of the jersey got back to the players on the team. So these jerseys here, our goalie, he was wearing them throughout the practices and everyone was like, yo, what are they for? We, uh, we all realized that Maggie had epilepsy and we, we all supported it and we were like, oh, we're all gonna get a jersey. I came up with the idea, I said, we have a tournament coming up, why don't we wear these as our alternate jerseys? And then it kind of just started from there. The entire squad became members of Team Maggie two weeks ago when they participated in a season-ending tournament held in Marlborough featuring teams from around New England. The Chiefs were coming off losing its league championship and was looking to redeem itself in the tournament. One of our big speaking points in the locker room this weekend was mental toughness. Um, we spent a lot of time on mental toughness and we used Maggie and her family as part of this. Um, so it was... we. We try to make it into a good learning experience as well as hockey too. There's a lot of life lessons that we can learn here and build off of. And build off it they did. The Chiefs won five games over a three-day span to come away with the championship. When we all won um, through our gloves, it was, it was a celebration as a team, as a family. I think it brought us together more. Every rally, every group, 
we said Maddie Strong. We talked about how we were playing for the name on our back. Um, I think it really motivated us, pushed more, did more, left everything out there for Maggie. The Chiefs didn't want to celebrate their accomplishments alone. Last week, they invited Maggie and her family to Driscoll Arena to present her with the championship trophy. Having the ability to come back here and do what we did tonight, presenting the trophy to her, um, kind of hit home. So I think everybody seen that at the end when we said we were going to give her the trophy and um, kind of like woke everybody up. We got to see her today. I mean, everybody's really happy that we get to meet her. She gets to see the trophy and stuff, see what we worked for, for her. Um, but it made it feel a lot better knowing that it was for a good cause and it was for someone who cared and is going through the struggle. Maggie and her family face a long road ahead. Doctors say it's likely she'll be dealing with epilepsy the rest of her life. Regardless, the Mendonca family remains thankful. We say every day is, is uh, a miracle. I mean, her doctors say she's a walking miracle, so honestly, we just think every day is uh, a blessed day. Just seeing everyone come together for us, and especially just for Maggie alone, is like, it really means a lot. And the seeing everyone, like, because we have people like around the whole country like that buy merchandise for Maggie, and just they'll take a picture with it in like different states, and I'm like, it's crazy how far her message is going. And like, that's all we want. We'll wrap up this edition of FRC Media News right after this. Welcome to Hot Dogs and Cool Cats. Today we have Wookie, a three-year-old male Yorkie West Phoenix. Uh, he's very personable, very friendly. He gets along with strangers very well. He does no sit. Um, that's probably the only command he knows at the moment, but it's a good base to start learning off of. He's very eager to please, eager to learn. Kids we'd like to have in the home be over 12, just because we don't know his history with them. Uh, cats he's okay with, dogs he's also okay with. He's very respectful of their boundaries. He is a breed that will need grooming, so that'll make for a good trip to the groomers. He's very easy to, easy to get along with. He does have a little bit of pull on the leash, um, so we would recommend putting him on a harness versus a collar just because of um, collapsing trachea that small breeds tend to have. So to minimize that, our harness will be perfect for him and he will get around on it just fine. So if you want to come down and meet Wookie, uh, come down to 300 Linwood Street uh, in Fall River, Massachusetts and make an appointment to see Wookie. Here I have Mulberry. Uh, Mulberry here is about five years old. Um, he is a bit of a special needs kid. Um, he sees the world a little crooked. He just has a bit of a head tilt. It doesn't really affect him in any way. Um, it's just a little quirk about him, basically. Um, he came from a home where there were a lot of cats and they just kind of kept breeding and breeding. Um, and because of that, he was born this way and he's got this little genetic deformity. Doesn't really affect him. He is a sweetheart. You can hear him purring the whole time, or at least I can. Um, but he is just a love, looking for a home. He does fantastic with other cats. Mulberry here is a wonderful boy. Um, if you guys want to come see Mulberry, feel free to fill out an application on our website at foreverpaws.com, um, or you can come in in person and come see this beautiful boy. That's all for this edition of FRC Media News. Please visit our website, frmedia.org, for all the latest news and local information. FRC Media News airs Thursdays at 6 p.m. and Fridays at 5.30 p.m. For all of us here at FRC Media News, I'm Keith Tebow. Have a great weekend. We'll see you next Thursday.